Okay, Rachel, you're driving us, so maybe we get started. We're just really excited to have this presentation today. Uh, I wanted to let you all know who's here with us, and if you're comfortable, share your name and, and your job in education and your geographic area in the chat box. We love to see who's joining us, and uh, I'm so pleased. I'm Amy Evans Godwin from ISKME. I'm so pleased to have this uh, amazing world education team with us today, Catalina Gonzalez. Shirley Doan, Jeff Gomas, and Rachel Riggs. Each of them will have a chance to uh, introduce themselves more extensively during the presentation. And uh, I have been at ISKME for the last 17 years. If you don't know ISKME, we're a global nonprofit that works in the education space dedicated to make learning experiences more equitable, open, and participatory. We've developed OER Commons uh, as a platform to support teaching and learning using OER and open education. And we have uh, services around libraries, professional learning, curation of OER and research. So really exciting to be able to find uh, that our facilitation of the Go Open Network has so much synergy with what world education has been doing, especially in the realm of digital equity. So let's pop to the next slide that will give you just an overview if you're not familiar with Go Open Network. We're a national group, uh, a community driven effort of educators and leaders, especially in the K-12 space that believe in open education and its transformation of teaching and learning. And what we do is share knowledge, we collaborate, and in the last two years, since we've been community driven after the first six years of being a federal initiative is really offer professional development opportunities and develop strategic actions that support practice and policy. And particularly the policy effort has been around digital equity. Once there is uh, the access to um, broadband connectivity and smart devices and uh, the hardware necessary to learn and teach online, what's the best way to use this technology? We're really advocating that um, equitable access to freely and openly licensed material really makes a difference. Uh, we encourage you to visit our hub and to join us, thanks, um, on OER Commons. There are groups there to join, there are resources to find, and you're encouraged to share your own resources and uh, build this community to uh, a wider uh, impact around OER. So you can take it away, Rachel. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. And hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I am going to skip my boring bio for now. I'll do that later. Um, but we wanted to get to know our audience a little bit. Um, so we have a Mentimeter poll. Um, you can scan the QR code on my slide here with your um, <laughs> mobile phone to participate in the poll, or you can go to menti.com and enter this code 56598175. Now don't panic, I'm gonna get out of that and I'm gonna go right back to the instructions as I switch over to Mentimeter. So don't worry, they're gonna be up again. Here we go. Okay, and then I'm gonna wait for you guys to jump into the Mentimeter. I'm gonna click here and copy the voting link and put it in the chat for you. So you can open it on your computer or on your mobile phone. Oh, wait, the code changed. Okay, so don't, whatever that code was that I just gave you on that slide, I don't know why it's different now, but it is. <laughs> so click the link in the chat or enter the code that is now on your screen and scan the QR code that is now on your screen. All right, I'm going to wait. I see some thumbs up, letting me know that, that you've arrived to the Mentimeter and you will be able to keep joining even once I advance. So I'm gonna go ahead and advance to the first question for those that are in. 
and I can't see my controls here. I'm going to use my keyboard. Oh, there they are. There's my arrows. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, so what we want to know first is what are you most familiar with already? So this is a ranking. Um, the topics are digital inclusion, digital literacy, the Digital Equity Act, and open education resources. So what are you most familiar with? Um, what the first being what you're most familiar with, and then you can rank down to least familiar. Digital inclusion, digital literacy. Oh, oh, there they go. They're popping up. They're popping up. Okay. Oh, we are. <laughs> okay. Got it. Digital equity act, least familiar. Okay. Awesome. Yay. Well, this will be really fun then. We're going to share a lot about the digital equity act. Um, and within that, you learn about digital inclusion and digital literacy, and then we'll talk about how we are fitting that into what we're doing in terms of open education. So very exciting. Now, our next question is, what do you want to learn most about? So this was just a vote. No need to rank. Same topics, digital inclusion, digital literacy, the Digital Equity Act, open education resources, digital inclusion. Okay. The Digital Equity Act, good, you're in the right place. I mean, you're really in the right place for all of them, but. <laughs> awesome. Okay, digital inclusion is a big one and I'm great, exciting. Not gonna keep fluffing it up, <laughs> get right to it. But is there anything else you want to discuss or cover today? So I presented those four topics. Is there something else? outside of those that you are expecting to hear about today and that's a priority for you. This is open-ended. Oh, Dan, good question. I'm sure Amy could answer that question in the chat. I think the difference is whoever's writing out the term. <laughs> um, okay, anything else? It looks like that's a no. So I, I'm glad, I think we've got a great plan. Just a L, yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, we are gonna jump right into it then. And we're starting with our amazing Tide team. Oh, oh, okay, OER for Bridging the Digital Divide. Okay, good, we'll get to that, awesome. Um, our awesome Tide team, Transforming Immigrant Digital Equity team. They are gonna get us started. Um, so welcome everyone to our webinar. We are from World Education and we're going to be talking today about strategic, sustainable, open education to boost digital equity. And we will share the slides later with you. I'm going to hand it over to our TIDE team. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, webinar. We are so excited to be here and great to see the comments and uh, answers to those questions. So I hope all your um uh, or your needs are met via this webinar. Um, just to give you a little bit of context, um, uh, this is part of the Transforming Immigrant Digital Equity Project. And we have been working on this um, for over almost two years now. And it's a continuation of the remote ESOL landscape analysis that we did in 2021. And this project works in three specific aspects. Number one is digital equity ecosystems that support immigrant and refugee learning, uh, uh, refugees that are learning English as an additional language in a holistically and intentionally intentional way. Uh, the second aspect is digital equity advocacy work. You're gonna hear a lot from my colleague Shirley in a minute about that. And finally, tech enable English language learning support uh, that we hope to make open and we'll share with you very soon. So stay tuned for more on that. Uh, to uh, give you an idea of what is happening today. So yeah, if you take me to the next slide, thank you, Rachel. There are three things that we are going to be addressing today. Number one, what is the Digital Equity Act? Number two, how can you take action? And number three, digital inclusion and open resources. So before we start, some important definitions here. I'm not gonna read what is on the screen because you can of course do that. Uh, but I want to highlight that digital equity is the goal that we are trying to achieve. And digital inclusion are the activities uh, that we do in order to work towards accomplishing that goal. Uh, digital literacy are the skills necessary to use technology. Uh, but I want to emphasize here digital resilience which is the ability, the skills, and the agility to be confident users of technology, and most importantly, to adapt to changing digital demands. 
So as we know, the digital environment is not static and it's constantly changing. So we need to develop the ability to and be resilient enough to navigate those changes effectively. So keep in mind those definitions as we continue with this presentation. Uh, I now want to talk about the elements of digital inclusion. And as you go to different websites, you may find different versions of this. There are some people that refer to three elements, mostly connectivity, devices, and digital skills. And others, uh, like you see here on the screen, talk about the five elements. And this includes applications and online content that meet user needs and technical support. As we go throughout the presentation, you will also hear about the Digital Equity Act. You can stay there, Rachel. And you will see that the government has a specific definition about the digital inclusion element. So for example, in the Digital Equity Act, again, this is just to give you context. You don't have to remember this necessarily, but take keep that in consideration. Uh, the Digital Equity Act, they talk about applications and online content specifically. Um, when they talk about this, they talk about government web websites and accessibility of applications. And a separate element is uh, privacy and cybersecurity. So again, there are multiple definitions of this. Tech support uh, in the, according to uh, the government is included on their devices. Uh, however, the five elements that we are showing you here are, are apply in general to most people and open an opportunity to intentionally talk about open educational resources, especially under online content that meets user needs. And Jeff will be talking much more about this. I won't um, take much more, more of time. Uh, so I'm going to pass it now to Chile. Thanks. So we're going to just take a few minutes to talk about what the Digital Equity Act is. And Rachel, if you'd like to move on to the next slide. So the Digital Equity Act is part of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, IIJA of 2021, and its purpose is to address the digital divide in historically underserved communities. It allocates $2.75 billion in spending over five years for digital equity and inclusion work. And as you can imagine, that is an unprecedented investment in digital equity and inclusion in the U.S. Digital Equity Act implementation is overseen by the Department of Commerce's National Telecommunications and Information Administration, which we obviously shortened to NTIA because that's a mouthful. On the next slide, you can see that the Digital Equity Act establishes three grant programs. The first is the State Planning Grant, which allocates formula funding for states and territories to create a digital equity plan over the course of one year. Then number two, the state capacity grant. So again, formula funding for states and territories to implement their digital equity plan over the course of five years. And last but not least, the competitive grant, which is competitive funding for both state and non-state eligible entities to implement digital inclusion activities again over the course of five years. And again, for the sake of this act, um, we are using the federal definition of digital inclusion, which overlaps of those elements that you saw on Catalina's slide, but isn't a total one-to-one -one match. Um, I will say I did see some commenters from outside the U.S., so I would love to know if there are similar kind of legislation happening in Canada. So on this slide, you can see that we are close to the end of 2023. So before states finalize their state digital equity plan, they have to open that draft up for a public comment period of at least 30 days. And as of today, 19 states have already published their draft plan for public comment. And we anticipate that a lot more states are going to publish their plan in November and December and possibly January as well. And states need to have a finalized state digital equity plan in order to apply for that second round of funding that I mentioned, which is that state capacity grant or implementation funding. And then once states receive those capacity grant awards, then the competitive grant funding will open up. Next slide, please. So what can you expect to see in your state's digital equity plan? Um, there are some requirements that were set by NTIA during the application process, and these uh, five areas here were the ones that were set in legislation. Um, so the state has to look at the barriers to digital equity that are faced by what they call covered populations in the state. And I'll go over what covered populations means in a moment. They have to set objectives to meet the five elements of digital inclusion that are laid out by the federal government. 
and they have to analyze how those objectives will affect the state's economic, educational, health, social, and other outcomes. Then lastly, the state also has to talk about how they're collaborating with key stakeholders, so it's not just an internal state-only effort to achieve the above objectives, and they have to explicitly list the organizations with which they're collaborating. Um, and state digital equity plans will also contain other requirements like asset mapping and needs assessment, um, and of course, their actual implementation strategies to ensure that they're meeting those objectives. So what do we mean when we, or rather the Digital Equity Act, say key stakeholders? So again, not going to read all these bullet points, um, but I'm betting that a lot of people here um, will fall into at least one of these categories. And so in that case, know that your state may not be actively reaching out to you. We know that the process um, for in each state is a little bit different, um, but know that according to legislation, you have every right to be at the table. Next slide, please. Thanks, the covered populations. So these are the quote unquote covered populations um, that are supposed to be prioritized under the Digital Equity Act. Um, and so here at World Education, we have been focusing primarily around advocacy on for individuals of a language barrier, individuals who are members of a racial or ethnic minority group, um, since our space is adult education. Um, but of course, you know, all of these populations, there's significant overlaps. Slide. And I think we can just bounce straight into the slide after that as well. Um, so why am I talking about the Digital Equity Act um, for that one person that said that they're interested in learning about it, but also because we believe that open education should be a solution that is proposed in state digital equity plans. Right now, a lot of states um, are still learning about the best ways to ensure that they're going to actually improve digital equity and inclusion for those covered populations. And of course, the expertise of all of you, as well as the remixability of open education resources can play an important role in helping the state meet their goals. Um, and I think if we go into the next slide, thank you. Um, so over the past one and a half years, the TIDE project has developed a number of resources to help um, primarily education programs, but community-based organizations at large meet these different goals. And I'm going to do a quick dump in the chat there. Um, so the four resources here that we have listed in this slide, the first one, identify how your work connects to the Digital Equity Act. So we know that a lot of education providers are not used to thinking of themselves as digital inclusion providers. And we've heard, especially when we were first starting um, out with this awareness building, that a lot of people felt like they didn't have anything to contribute in terms of the Digital Equity Act. But we believe that you do. You have a lot of expertise in serving your learners, your students. Um, and so this worksheet kind of just helps break down some of the components of the Digital Equity Act legislation and connect it to your work. Number two, once, sorry, Rachel, if you can go back. Number two, once you've done that, so identify who's leading Digital Equity Act planning and implementation in your state. Most of the time, it's going to be the broadband office. Um, and so our Digital Equity Act tracker, which is that second link, um, breaks down who's doing the work in each state, as well as any ongoing stakeholder engagement efforts, including surveys, focus groups, um, public listening sessions. And then we've also started listing um, all of the states that have published their state digital equity plans for public comment as well. So we recommend checking that one out as well. Then number three, um, the third resource, identify the areas of your state's digital equity plan, your best position to be involved in. We see a lot of different opportunities in the plan for education providers to be involved. Um, and so we've annotated the uh, NTIA provided state digital equity plan template with different recommendations for how organizations might be involved in each section, depending on their interests, capacity, and expertise. And last but not least, of course, bringing others along with you. The more people who are asking for open education, the more people who are education providers at the table, um, the better the plan will be in order to actually address the needs of our learners and the people that we serve. Um, so we have a remixable slide deck that you can use to advocate for why adult learners should be included in state digital equity plan and planning efforts. 
So taking a moment to just focus um, on public commenting. So again, just to review, so before finalizing their state digital equity plans, states have to post that draft for public comment for a period of no less than 30 days. And they have to consider all comments received during that comment period and incorporate or make any changes based off of quote unquote worthwhile comments. Um, and then when states submit that finalized plan in order to receive their implementation funding, they have to actually describe any and all changes that they made to the plan in response to those comments. And they have to write a response to each comment that they receive. So know that any comment you're putting out will be read um, and hopefully meaningfully incorporated into your state's digital equity plan. So Instead of me talking about that at length here, um, I'm gonna point you in the way of our most recent blog post where we break down some more requirements for the public comment process, as well as what to look for as you read or perhaps skim your state's digital equity plan. We have this checklist that we've developed for specifically adult education and immigrant inclusion providers um, that highlight different areas of inclusion um, and partnership um, thanks for putting that those links in the chat, Jeff, um, as you read your plan. And specifically, open education is listed as one of those uh, metrics to keep an eye out for. So we hope that that will help guide your reading as well. Of course, we also want uh, have some recommendations for what to include in your public comment, perhaps using our checklist as a starting point. Um, and then lastly, just because, again, TIDE focuses specifically on immigrant and refugee learners, we have some suggestions for how our learners can get involved as well. It's important that the state hears from us as providers, but of course they should also be hearing from the people who are directly affected by the digital divide. So we have a map, which believe it or not, even though I created this at 4 p.m. yesterday, is already outdated. Um, so this is just a map highlighting all of the states that currently have uh, their public comment period open and they're in green. The blue are states that have their public comment period already closed. Um, and Missouri made their plan public at like 5.30 p.m. yesterday. Um, so that is the fourth state that should be green on this map. And Thank I'm going to pass it back to Catalina. Thank you, Julian. So lots of information. I'm going to give you one more resource uh, that we hope can help you figure out what action to take next. So this is a PDF uh, with the links there. These are the resources that Shirley mentioned earlier. But again, the most important thing is to know if your state has released their digital equity plan draft. Find if yes or not. If yes, read our blog and use the checklist. And as I pointed out also on the chat, uh, we specifically uh, created an item there uh, to ensure that everybody's looking for open educational resources. Are they part of the plan or not? And so that's an opportunity for you to make comments specifically uh, related to, to that aspect. If your plan has not been released yet, you still have an opportunity, use our slide deck to put together uh, you know, some information, some data, uh, bring some partners along with you, and then contact your state lead. Uh, again, you can find that information on that link uh, and make sure that you are at the table. Uh, so I'm gonna pause here. Thank you guys. Um, I think we could maybe do like one minute of questions specifically about the Digital Equity Act. At the end of today's session, we actually have like kind of three ways for you to think about what you've learned and how you'll take it and, and do something with it. So we can wait until the end, but if there's anything specifically about the Digital Equity Act that you wanna ask Shirley and Catalina now while it's fresh, um, go for it. I think you can put it in the chat or you could unmute because we're a nice small group here. Um, and I'm just imagining uh, Shirley at the table coloring in the states every night. <laughs> I was just like shocked that that's been updated since 4 p.m. yesterday and <laughs> you're working so hard. Um, you're like a news reporter now. Um, okay. So we're gonna go ahead and transition now into 
our open education initiative, which is called Crowded Learning. And I'm going to hand it over to Jeff. And we're going to share just a few ways that we are thinking about taking the work that Shirley and Catalina have done and existing expertise in digital equity, digital inclusion, and what we're doing to infuse those principles into our open education initiative and how we see these two things really coming together. So, um, Jeff. All right. Uh, hi, my name is Jeff Gumas. Are we? Oh, so I guess before we start, um, in thinking about open education resources, uh, which it sounds like from our earlier poll, most of you have a pretty strong background in, um, and thinking about these elements that Catalina had covered earlier on in terms of the elements of digital inclusion, we're just interested in hearing from your perspective how uh, you feel. Uh, open education, open ed educational resources can support uh, any or all of these specific elements of digital inclusion. So again, um, feel free in the chat or out loud um, to just share uh, your ideas in terms of how these two things relate, the, the aspect of open education resources and these elements of digital inclusion. There's a specific area that you feel seems to strongly connect or what we could be doing with open education resources to support any of these elements. It's a shy group. Okay, yep, digital literacy training. Thank you, Tammy, for get, getting the, uh, the ball rolling here. Anything else that's coming to mind or things that you're doing that you feel support digital inclusion that you're aware of or resources that you're uh, aware of? Oh, I can share uh, some of Go Open's work uh, related. Great. I was gonna share this anyway, but um, we have a, a guide to connecting digital equity and OER and some other resources on the hub, like um, a letter that you would send to your state leads or a toolkit that helps you create messaging online. So being active, educating yourself around what your state is doing and knowing how to speak to the benefits or, of OER is part of that, the action that, that we advocate for. And that's why we're so aligned with what you have all been working on. So, uh, and it looks like Evelyn, who uh, is aware of, of the work of Crowded Learning and has been involved in um, uh, some of Crowded Learning's efforts, uh, is, is pointing out some two things that we will show today. Um, and Dan, thanks. I agree. Yeah, most of the things um, support the use of open education resources in terms of um, providing, in particular, I feel like technical support and digital literacy training are very much intertwined. Um, but then even a device is only as good as, as we've said here as the skills that folks have to be able to use them. Um, need digital literacy training for limited English, social media. Um, and Dan, I see that you said op open educational resources. I know that we will, uh, I'm anxious to hear your distinction at the end um, when we get into questions because I, I noted that earlier on. So moving on, um, my name is Jeff Gumas and I am the Senior Technical Advisor with World Education and the EdTech Center. And I also lead the um, Open Education Initiative of World Education, which is called Crowded Learning. And I'm Rachel Riggs. I am a technical advisor at World Education, and I also work on kind of learning and love all the work that we're doing. <laughs> so if we move on to the next slide, uh, I'm just going to give some background on what crowded learning is. Um, and you'll probably note some similarities to uh, ISKME and maybe other organizations that you know that work within the OER space. Um, but crowded learning is a is something that was started actually in 2017. It actually began uh, here in Illinois as a nonprofit organization that in 2020 merged into um, World Education uh, just to 
realistically increase our scale and opportunity um, for things that we were finding around what we feel is an open content ecosystem that can be centered around open education resources, as well as equipping instructors and practitioners with the knowledge and skills to use those resources effectively, but also design those resources. Um, and our journey in this, in this uh, world started actually specifically around trying to develop a tool uh, called SkillBlocks that cataloged, open vetted, and curated open education resources to skills that adults need. Um, specifically adults, because that's that's the background that I come from and that world education, at least domestically, focuses on. Um, and recognized when we released Skillbox in March 2020, which may be a date that rings a bell as when the world's changed, um, we recognized very quickly that despite having this tool that cataloged those resources effectively for educators, just in the area of math at that time, that just having the resources was not enough for them to be effective um, and that there needed to be training around how to use those resources and more importantly training on how to maybe adapt ex extant resources that could be well suited for remote instruction um, but uh, needed to be adapted in some way in order to be accessible and mobile friendly um, and, and more easily available and organized for students. And so as, as that enlightenment happened during the pandemic, we established processes um, to train teachers in using educational technologies and in designing open education resources that may or may not leverage those technologies and then designing those with a goal in mind of say specifically maybe digital literacy resources and curating digital literacy resources around a set of skills. Um, basically looking to address areas of resource need, whether it be a lack of digital resources or just a lack of localized or contextualized content, um, given that in adult education, we do have that barrier of someone who might be at a, say, third grade reading level, but there is a lack of appropriate reading materials that are at a third grade reading level. And so these two things combined create what we call our ecosystem. And if you can go to the next slide, which involves two main activities that we, we do here at Crowded Learning. Um, in terms of those processes, it's a process and a service learning engagement called the EdTech Makerspace. And this is focused on the generation of open education resources. And in these op uh, EdTech Makerspaces, uh, we basically identify an area of resource need and identify what our goal is for addressing that need, whether it's the curation of extant resources that are available that just need to be organized and cataloged in a way that's meaningful to adult practitioners and adult learners, or creating original activities, open education resources, or adapting resources to make them more accessible. And all of those resources end up going into our OER platform, which is called SkillBlocks. And SkillBlocks catalogs those resources as well as other high quality vetted and evaluated resources that we, we know work or are appropriate for adults to a set of subject area and skill frameworks that again are meaningful um, to our adult education population. So in addition to math, which was the original uh, focus, uh, just as our sort of pilot of skill blocks, we've added in digital literacy as our second uh, subject area. And in the next month or so, we'll be adding civics education, health education, uh, health literacy, um, financial literacy, and workforce preparation um, as frameworks within skill blocks to which we've organized resources that are openly accessible to instructors and to learners. And so over the course of the past three years, we've been running makerspaces, we've been rolling out skill blocks, and we've actually expanded our work into international um, uh, opportunities. Uh, we just finished a project in St. Lucia in which there was a goal of increasing digital literacy of, of low sec lower secondary students as well as the digital literacy skills of instructors. And at the same time, working to generate and contextualize more resources that were specific to St. Lucian youth and St. Lucian um, subject areas. And so our model moving forward that incorporates the makerspace and skill blocks really 
has these four elements that Rachel is going to walk through now um, in terms of activities that we've done that, that do connect to this notion of digital inclusion. So one is first just defining the skills. What are the skills? And in this case, digital literacy skills that are most important to the target population. Um, and then the second component of that is train teachers in the tools or, or the skills um, that they are in turn going to be training students and, and, and pointing students towards. Um, the third thing is addressing resource gaps. And it may be that there are open education resources that are perfectly suitable for those specific areas that just might need to be cataloged more effectively so they're easier to retrieve, um, or that may be actually adapting um, resources that exist or creating new resources from scratch um, that support the areas of need. And then finally, uh, having some type of mechanism for facilitating OER use. There is OER Commons, there's other OER repositories, excuse me, repositories. We have a tool called Skillblocks um, that we've designed specifically for specific um, groups that we work with in the um, US domestic market. But um, these are those four components and Rachel is now going to walk through what those look like. Thanks. So kind of bringing this all, I wanted to highlight within each of these things, what, how they connect to digital inclusion. And so how, you know, the approach is unique and has digital equity as an end goal. Um, so Jeff talked about, you know, developing frameworks and what we've found to be important in our work developing frameworks is not just to um, make a decision about what the scope of digital skills are that learners need, but also to develop frameworks that can be crosswalked to existing standards, assessments, curricula. And so we have developed aggregate frameworks, the digital skills frameworks that um, we work with are aggregate frameworks that pull together those different elements so that whatever framework instructors are using for digital skills they can integrate digital skills into existing content areas, like what you're seeing right now is a framework for civics. Um, and they can, you know, kind of integrate digital skills into civics instruction, or um, maybe you teach writing, whatever it may be, taking those digital skills and integrating them into other content areas. Um, and also providing this flexible way to use frameworks and find the alignment to other materials that educators are using, like assessments. So Jeff has shared a link to our subject area frameworks. We developed these specifically for adult literacy educators in the US. And we also um, developed a framework in St. Lucia for digital literacy, which we then worked with educators to help them um, think through ways that they could integrate that framework into their instruction, which brings me to our next um, component. No, it doesn't. <laughs> It'll come after this. <laughs> um, but another crucial piece of the puzzle is to identify and address resource gaps. And so we work with um, key stakeholders to engage educators and others in um, generating OER that meets the needs of the context. And this is important when we talk about digital inclusion, because when there is a diversity of resources available, then educators can make better decisions around what open ed resources they want to implement according to the access that their learners have. So we talked about access to the internet, we talked about devices, online content, and being able to fill those resource gaps and provide a broader range of resources, again, enables instructors to consider the, the access of the end learner that's going to be using the resources and not just the access to devices in the internet, but also their skill level. Um, and so, you know, do will they learn better through a game, a highly interactive digital game that's online and requires internet access, or is something like a video that can be downloaded and accessed offline and doesn't require a lot of interaction with technology, something that's better suited for the learner. 
Oh yes, and Jeff also shared the digital skills library. And so this was an activity that we did with educators um, to fill the gap. So we looked at the existing digital skills resources that we had curated, we identified the gaps, and then we curated more to fill those gaps. And all of that is now in um, on a site that we call the digital skills library that Jeff just shared. So we're very intentional about involving teachers in everything that we're doing. We really view them as the catalyst for open education and for digital equity. Um, and so a really core element of the work that we do is training teachers to use technology, attending to their digital skills and helping them build their digital skills um, so, so that they can also design accessible and adaptable OER. And within the design of that OER and our evaluation of OER, we have these key criteria that we um, use to guide teachers in evaluating OER or creating their own OER. Those criteria are credibility, relevance, learning support, accessibility, and openness. And they're based off of existing literature um, and guidance in, in the world of OER. I'm sure Jeff will grab us a link to our Actually, we'll, we'll definitely share a link to our evaluation and activity design guides um, in a minute. But what's important about these criteria really to me when it comes to digital equity is the accessibility and openness. So really having teachers think about um, what accessibility, a really core component to digital inclusion, um, and then also openness, because we know that if resources can be shared and adapted, then they can be adapted to address the needs of the end user, which is a way of being more digitally inclusive, right? So if I share everything only on a website where nothing can be downloaded um, and it requires constant internet access and nobody can adapt that, and um, turn it into something that a learner without access to a large screen or, in, or broadband, um, if I can adapt that for that learner, then that is another way of us collaboratively pushing forward toward digital equity. So in the EdTech Makerspace, teachers collaborate in service learning for a six week period. Um, and it is intentionally has that longer duration to really help them develop new skills and to give them the time to collaborate and reflect and communicate throughout the process. So it is a service learning professional development takes place over six weeks. We learn new ed tech tools and OER guidelines. And I know that we have the audience today, some people who have participated in ed tech maker spaces. So hi, <laughs> thanks for joining. Um, and so we, you know, the learning component is to learn new technology, learn about OER, and then the service component is to actually apply that learning in the curation and or generation of OER. Um, and so they are either learning how to evaluate the OER and then curate it for a library like the digital skills library, or learning how to design their own OER, keeping in mind these different criteria. Um, and then the end result of an EdTech makerspace is quality curated OER shared broadly for reuse. So it's a, an end product of um, a library or a set of resources that those teachers had a hand in making and can carry into their classroom and use, um, but can also be shared more broadly for reuse. And then finally, the other component of our crowded learning um, model is the facilitation of OER use. And I think a lot of that takes place in the EdTech makerspace just by way of learning um, more about OER and how to use it. But then we also have a tool called Skillbox that facilitates that. Um, so in Skillbox, we're attending to digital equity and digital inclusion by first including the digital literacy subject area. Skillbox is a tool where you can go in, you select a subject and a skill, and you find free and open content that aligns to that skill. And so there, that's the digital literacy piece of the digital inclusion, inclusion puzzle, right? Everything that is in the digital skills library that Jeff shared is also in Skillbox. So teachers can go in and 
and curate um, different learning resources and put them together in a skill box. And a skill box is essentially a collection of different learning objects that they can then share with the learner. Um, and for the learner, it's very easy to get into, they can scan a QR code or they can enter an access code. I invite you to scan this QR code and take a look at the skill box that we created around creating safe passwords. Um, so like I was saying, in, in skill box, we're attending to digital inclusion by first attending to the digital skills portion. We're also looking to the future to add tags for offline access resources so that teachers can retrieve resources um, that can be downloaded or um, otherwise used without access to the internet. And we'll add a tag for mobile friendly resources so that teachers can know which resources will be compatible with a smaller screen device. Um, so those are two other areas that we are looking to um, be more digitally inclusive within the resources that we have in Skillbox. So we do have an EdTech Makerspace that starts this Friday. If anybody is interested in joining, you are welcome to do so. Um, we have one starting Friday and it will all, it will be all about learning to use skill blocks. Um, and we are going to start out creating skill blocks with just digital literacy resources. So you'll get a really good sampling of the digital, different digital literacy resources that are in skill blocks. And then we're going to expand into other subject areas and create skill blocks for other subject areas. So feel free to join us. I think Jeff will share a link to the registration. Um, but before we wrap up today, I really wanted to um, bring it all home because we've shared a lot with you guys about the Digital Equity Act, about digital skills and digital inclusion, and, um, and then also about this, you know, development of OER and curation of OER. So I was thinking, you know, why don't we set out these three different possibilities here, right, of what you guys can do moving forward away from this webinar and into um, your work. Three things. The first would be to advocate for and promote digital equity. And so I think that Shirley and Catalina gave you guys some really great resources that will get you set down that road and thinking about how you can um, raise your voice when it comes to your state digital equity plan and even amplify the voices of your learners in that. Um, so that's kind of bucket number one, right? That advocacy piece. The other piece is to attend to learners' digital skills. So that's a big piece of the digital inclusion puzzle. Um, you may not be able to go and purchase broadband access for all of your learners, um, but you certainly can begin to think about how you integrate technology in a really strategic and meaningful way um, in a way that supports learners' digital skills, no matter what content or subject area you're teaching right now. So we have shared with you guys a checklist um, that you can look at. It'll give you a sense of what digital skills your learners need and, and what digital skills you might wanna focus on in your classes. So that's kind of option number two for taking action. And then option number three is thinking about curating and creating OER with access and digital inclusion in mind. And so what we've shared with you is an evaluation guide. So if you're curating open ed resources for your classes, um, you can use the evaluation guide to see how those resources stack up in these different areas and specifically thinking about accessibility and um, how they're gonna work on different devices. Um, and then the other resource that's in this section is um, an activity design guide. So we realize that you're not always just curating, you may be actually creating your own OER. Um, and so creating those also with access in mind and using those same criteria that we would use to evaluate OER. So I want you guys to scan the QR code. Thank you, Jeff. Jeff shared the link to the EdTech Makerspace. So that is spans six weeks, starts on Friday. It'll go through December. Um, so feel free to take a look at that. Um, and I would love for you guys to scan this QR code and take a look at the resources. I'm also going to open it here. And I think let's just take a little time to 
ask questions and to chat about what we all can do to whether we're more on the digital equity and advocacy side or more on the open education implementation side, what can we all do to bring these two worlds together and really um, take action <clears throat> and work toward that ultimate end goal of digital equity. So this is a skill box. I mean, it had to be, right? How could I not? Um, <laughs> It's a skill box with all of the different resources. So like I said, if you're looking to push further into advocacy, that's this first one. If you're looking to think about how you can better integrate digital skills, that's these two here. And then our evaluation and design guide are these two here. Um, would love to hear thoughts, questions. What are you thinking about diving into? What are you looking at right now? I think that's the end of our presentation. So at this point, we just really want to hear from you guys. Is anybody out there? <laughs> anybody want to tell us what they will do moving forward, whether they're drawn more to advocacy, skills instruction, or you know the the OER part of the puzzle. Should I start calling on people? <laughs> it feels right. Oh, here we go. Thanks, Evelyn. Evelyn is teaching a new digital literacy class, and we'll look into using the digital skills checklist. Awesome. Evelyn has participated in many edtech maker spaces, and she's incredible um, a mover and shaker and user of OER. Other thoughts? What will you do? What are your next steps? Hi, Dan. Um, I just placed a video, a link to a video that explains what I'll be doing. And just to tie in, because it may, there may, uh, you may not immediately see the connection to what I'm doing and to what you're talking about here, but let me try to make that for you. Because I am spent the last year working primarily with elementary teachers in Africa, doing, uh, creating, um, translating and uh, uh, doing professional development on digital skills for teachers to be able to use those OER. Cool. Um, and how that ties into what we may be doing here with the Digital Equity Act is that we're discovering that uh, first language acquisition is key, specifically in Africa, where there's somewhere around a thousand different languages. Mm -hmm. And uh, trying to teach everyone English first is not working. Uh, it doesn't work in Africa, and it actually doesn't work in the United States either. So one of the things that we need to do is actually start teaching kids literacy in their first language first. Mm -hmm. uh, that means we need to have content in their first language Yeah. to be able to teach them that. And then the teachers need to be able to use that content in an effective digital manner with their students. So it, it's actually, I'm saying everything that you've said, it's just being very specific about a content area. Quite on the, on the other end of Jeff's work where um, we're talking about kindergarten and first and second and third graders as opposed yeah. to adult learners. But sometimes adult learners need to know that literacy piece too. Just so it's there's a it's a little bit different, but you can watch our video and look at my links too if you want. Absolutely. No, I think that's so important. Um, and language access, I think, is an important um, thing to talk about. And, you know, we also know here in the United States, my background is actually in teaching English to speakers of other languages. And we, we do know that supporting um, first language, home language literacy in conjunction with learning a new language is very important for um, adults and, and children. So thanks for sharing that, Dan. Oh, let me see, there's a comment. I just put a comment about, uh, I, I, I'm impressed by your evaluation criteria being very um, uh, comprehensive and holistic related to how materials have to be adaptable. Many people are publishing materials that they put an open license on, but they're not yet usable by everyone. And one of the things for Go Open and, and ISKME is to train teachers in making materials 
accessible to meet the accessibility standards for those with disabilities and learning differences and preferences. So that's really a, a great high priority for, for um, our movement and for you, that's great. Yeah, um, that has been a big area of focus and we're very mindful about how we choose which tools we're creating OER with in the ed tech maker spaces. And I think because it's so teacher driven, it really helps us stay grounded in that aspect because we could have lofty ideas of publishing something that's, you know, animated with a million different, you know, like fancy schmancy, but um, we're always thinking about, will this teacher be able to leave the ed tech maker space with this resource and flexibly adapt it to whatever they're doing, whatever tools that they use. So I wanted to show, we have this um, digital skills glossary that we created. And um, again, there were like a bunch of different ed tech tools we could have thought about using in the creation of a digital skills glossary. Um, what we ultimately used as the core resource are Google Slides, right? Because that's something that most people know how to use. Um, it's something downloadable, it's easily adaptable. Um, so we put, we published the library in Google Slides. That's what the teachers were working in in the EdTech Maker space. We also published it in a Google Sheet so that if they don't want any of the actual presentation elements, they could just take the terms and definitions and, and do their own thing with with it. And then in the instructor guide, we included guidance and ideas around other ed tech tools. So if you want to do a flippity, if you want to do a Jamboard, if you want to um, take the glossary and adapt it and make it more interactive, you certainly can. Um, but to have those core resources as something that's really easily adaptable is a big priority of ours. Thanks for pointing that out, Amy. Great. We have one more minute. So if you can yeah. just skip down to uh, how to get in touch with Go Open, that would be wonderful. And, yes. Uh, loads. Okay, here we go. Yeah. And okay. want to encourage everyone to uh, look into joining Skill Blocks, your ed tech makerspace all the tools that the World Ed team has highlighted today and to join us in Go Open. You can find us in social media on LinkedIn. We, we look to have um, some deeper conversations about this space on Twitter X and in our newsletter, you can stay up to date. You can reach me or the Go Open network at these emails and uh, also get in touch with World Ed at all those links. So thank you so much for being here. There's a lot of work out there for all of us to do to advocate yeah. and create usable OER for, for the world to keep teaching and learning transforming and, and relevant. So thank you. Thank you, Amy. Go open. Hashtag go open, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Guys, have a great afternoon, evening. I'll, I'll, I'll turn off the recording but uh, I could stay on for a minute.